Our next panel uh, is Capturing Opportunities in Distressed Real Estate, Multifamily Retail and Hospitality. The moderator for that panel is Dave Lamb, National Property Director, Sunstar Insurance. Dave? Yes, everybody. Thank you for coming to our presentation, Cap Capturing Opportunities in the Distressed Real Estate, Multifamily Retail and Hospitality. As mentioned, my name is Dave Lamb and I'm the National Property Director for Sunstar Insurance which is one of the fastest growing insurance brokerages in the U.S. In eight short years as a company, we've become the 45th largest independent agency in the U.S. I specialize in working with property managers and owners across the U.S. with an emphasis on multifamily, and I personally insure over 60,000 units, including market rate, coastal, LIHTC, aluminum wiring, and shock loss, shock loss properties both through the open market, as well as creating multi-billion dollar Lloyd's programs. I'm very excited to moderate on this panel, as it's a topic a lot of my customers are asking me about. And I'm now going to introduce our panel and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, first off, uh, Brian, could you introduce yourself? Sure, good morning. My name is Brian Prenevo, and I'm the Director of Investor Relations at Safe Harbor Equity. Safe Harbor Equity is a private equity firm specializing in the acquisition of non-performing or distressed commercial real estate loans. We focus on the four you know, main food groups of commercial real estate, which are office, industrial, multifamily, and retail. Uh, after acquisition of a distressed loan, we work with borrowers to restructure or, or refinance a loan or conduct a workout. Most often, we get to a payoff in 9 to 18 months after acquisition. If the loan remains non-performing, we will prosecute a foreclosure and take title of the underlying collateral. However, we generally try to sell that property as soon as possible as we are not in the business of managing a portfolio of real estate units or, or square footage. We launched our first fund in 2015. And now that fund has uh, fully liquidated. Our third fund, which was launched in May of 2019, is still in the investing window. And fund three has the same investment mandate as our previous funds. Thank you very much. Um, Cross, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Cross Moseri. I'm the co-CEO of Presidium, which is a Texas-based uh, development owner, operator, and manager uh, of primarily multifamily assets. Um, though we do uh, also participate in, in all food groups, uh, student housing, retail, office, and hospitality as well. Um, We've been active for essentially the past two decades, and we have a current portfolio under management of about $2 billion AUM. Um, we participate primarily in uh, the southern U.S. Uh, with, a, again, a large concentration in Texas itself. Um, we have been uh, actively developing real estate over the last uh, five to six years and have kind of changed our business model from an acquisition value add group to a, uh, a developer and have migrated into uh, developing large scale mixed use master plan communities, um, uh, three of which we're currently working on here in Texas. Thank you very much. Uh, Chad, can you introduce yourself? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chad Carpenter. I'm the CEO of Revin Capital. We are a private investment management company headquartered in La Jolla, California. Uh, we recently launched a new fund, uh, Opportunistic Fund, and we're looking to invest with uh, local operators in all asset classes for discounted uh, assets or debt portfolios, foreclosures. We're looking to deploy five to 25 million of equity per deal. Love to meet uh, some new um, partnerships. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, also, Stephen, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Steve Solomon. I am a, uh, a lawyer, unfortunately. I'm a partner at Friedlander Missler. I specialize in hotel transactions of all type, buying, selling, refinancing, restructuring, you know, financing, the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. We, um, you know, have uh, been through a few of the downturns. And, um, you know, we, you know, we like to think that we kind of, you know, got a feel for what's going on. Great, great. Well, first of all, let's kind of start off with one of the questions that we're, that we're getting all the time. Uh, Cross, what are you seeing in the 
in the capital markets for acquisition and development? You know, essentially, um, you know, the, the, while there was a little blip three to four months ago, uh, as we kind of uh, got into the, the, the initial stages of, of the COVID situation, um, you know, essentially the financing markets ha have held up pretty strong as, you know, I know has been talked about on a number of, of panels over the last couple of days. I mean, there's, there's no lack of equity now that's been raised and that's been on the sideline chasing opportunity. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the opportunity is yet to present itself, um, but the, the capital markets are incredibly liquid. Uh, rates remain low. We have been out uh, pricing a, a few uh, development projects. And um, while, you know, lenders are somewhat skittish about leverage, uh, as I think everyone's sort of experienced, um, rates are incredibly compelling. And, and there are some, some groups out there that are willing to, to stretch uh, at least on the traditional banking side, up to 65% um, loan to cost on, on new development projects. So, you know, on the equity side, um, I think that that is still out there. Um, we, our, our group has essentially transitioned, as I mentioned, from a, a value-add shop to a, a development shop, um, primarily because we couldn't justify the, the cap rates uh, that we're seeing in the value-add space over the last two to three years when you could build at, at much more compelling cap rates. And I think, um, you know, the capital is still there on the equity side as well for any development project that's in a, a prime location. We're, we're really blessed to be operating primarily in, in some of the strongest markets in, in the country in, in Dallas and Austin. Um, but, you know, we haven't seen much of a drop off at all um, from our ability to capitalize projects. Well, well, it kind of goes into uh, on the lending side. Uh, Steve, what are kind of the approaches that bank lenders and CMBS lenders, and how is that different right now? Well, uh, there's actually some positive activity on the bank lending side and the private lending side, and there's virtually no activity on the CMBS market side. The CMBS servicers and special servicers have almost uniformly stated that there will be no movement of any um you know if any restructuring or sale of loans or whatever until the end of 2020 at the very earliest you know so they're basically in a pattern of you know tr you know of, of in many cases just staying you know having radio silence for you know the foreseeable future and in many other instances, just putting a Band-Aid with some sort of limited forbearance agreement where they're looking for the, the borrower and the, the, and, the, and the principals that make up the borrower's group to you know, put up you know, some sort of additional funds if possible. That's kind of where you're looking there. Uh, but there hasn't been any real activity and there's been very little foreclosure work. Um, on the debt, on the lender side, there's still a big gap between the bid and the ask for sales of loans, but activity is actually happening. You're starting to see it. it you know, it, the, you know, the spigot hasn't opened you know, fully yet, but you're seeing more than a couple drips and drops. So there are some opportunities from lenders, and I see that actually getting a little stronger as the year goes by. And a lot of that's going to be dependent when you're dealing with um, financial institutions and banks. It's going to be uh, dependent on the regulatory climate because you might see the regulator, the regulators, um, you know, pr require that the lenders mark to market the deals, or you know, more in the alternative, you know, really, you know, you know, have a direct hit on your assets for non-performing loans. At this point, there's relief from that. Well, Chad, you know. Steve said there he hasn't seen a whole lot of foreclosures currently. When do you think we will start seeing foreclosures? And what type of real estate assets and classes are under the most stress right now due to, due to COVID-19? Yeah, I think, uh, can you guys hear me okay? I just want to check. Can you yeah, guys? Uh, I yeah. can hear you, Chad. Great. Uh, yeah, no, I think Steve's right. There, there has been a trickle of uh, REOs. We're actually watching the... Uh, CMBS defaults on a uh, on a kind of minute by minute basis here, 
And it's amazing. Uh, uh, it's really ticked up quite a bit in July. And we're seeing, we're seeing all asset classes go into special servicing, grace period, workout, um, uh, 30 day, 60 day, 90 day in REO. There, we, but we are seeing a, a tick up in actually REO and they are, they are starting to happen. And um, it's all asset classes. The bulk is uh, hotel and retail, but we're seeing uh, a lot of office and, uh, and, and obviously malls. And uh, what's really interesting is uh, starting in July, we've seen just an avalanche of multifamily loans go into the 30 day delinquency. So, so I, I, I agree with Steve. I think, uh, I think, you know, it's later in the year, early next year, the foreclosures will start. Um, I think they're definitely going to be here. Uh, uh, mostly, mostly retail, uh, hospitality and office. Well, Brian, how is this current market kind of impacting your business and your investing opportunities? And how do you find the distressed debt opportunities right now? Uh, yeah, so thanks, thanks for the question. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we launched this fund uh, in, in May of 2019 when things were, were still pretty good in the economy, actually very good. And even then, they're, they're in almost every economic cycle, there are always opportunities for distressed commercial real estate debt. There are always various reasons for somebody going into default. Uh, but however, obviously, in this current economic environment, the opportunity set is increasing dramatically. Now, from our perspective, you know, it, it sort of seems as if the opportunities are sort of three, six or nine months out and, and everyone is kind of getting their ducks in a row, sort of waiting for, you know, these commercial real estate loans that are either current or 30 days maybe late and maybe working out through some type of forgiveness to moving to the 90 day to moving to actually distress, which we think is just kind of working its way through the calendar. Um, so we do think that the opportunity set is going to increase dramatically uh, for our business and for our fund and, and how we source those deals and how we find these deals is typically through lenders uh, that we have partnerships with or that we work with that um, you know, we, we, we execute, we've executed several deals in the past. They know us, we have a good track record and, you know, eventually they are going to want to get these loans off their books. And we, you know, as I said, we've established a partnership and a track record with these, with these lenders. And that's typically how we source our deals. You know, Steve, from a, you know, from being a lawyer, how are the courts kind of addressing these foreclosures in the lights of, you know, COVID and what's kind of going on with the current legislation? Well, with regards to how the courts are handling it, they're all over the place. It, you know, it depends on jurisdictions. For instance, recently, the, you know, one of the, you know, one, uh, the, the hotel in New York that has the highest, um, you know, the, the highest room rental for a suite, and I think it's like $75,000 a night, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's called the Mark Hotel, you know, it's a high-end hotel. They had somebody come in and buy their thirty million dollar, uh, buy a thirty million dollar mez loan, you know, um, on a distressed loan sale, and then they immediately went to foreclosure, and the court threw out the foreclosure, saying that they were predatory. So a lot of it depends on who your who your judge is and what jurisdictions you're in. Um, it you know, it seems to me that it uh, you're 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 going to have certain you know doubts regarding where this is going. You see some people in, uh, from legislative standpoint, is there going to be any relief from foreclosures? Um, you know, at this point, for instance, in residential situations and in some jurisdictions, you know, some states or counties or whatever, um, you see prohibitions against foreclosures, not only in residential, but in other, uh, other aspect cast, uh, classes. You know, at what point will the will the legislation kick in on a on a global basis, or will it just continue to be you know bits and pieces locally? So before you get into a certain asset you know, asset acquisition or loan acquisition, you really have to get a feel for the remedies that a particular lender might have and the defenses that you might have to any action that the lender brings. 
from a you know from a uh, you know in, in, you know pure logic perspective, at some point, if they're going to give relief to tenants on the tenants um, being evicted and the tenants having to pay rent, there's going to have to be if you know some changes with regards to the owners being foreclosed upon by their lenders. Otherwise, all the owner the owners are going to bear the burden of the losses entirely, as opposed to the you know as opposed to the tenants and as opposed to the um, the you know and as opposed to the, um, the the borrowers. Well, going along with that, cross. I mean, are you seeing distress in the in the multifamily space, and what kind of opportunities are you are you seeing? At this time, we really haven't seen much. Um, we have a, a pretty large portfolio uh, in Texas and in Florida, and uh, operationally, um, you know, while it's it's been um, slightly down in terms of revenue and, and occupancy, um, you know, it's held uh, way better than than other asset classes. So, you know, I think we're probably off five percent year over year. Um, on, on collections uh, than we were, you know, uh, last year. So, you know, you're not seeing much distress. I, I think we we hit on uh, previously just a little bit of, uh, you know, what's happening in the CMBS market. And, you know, as it relates to, to multifamily, um, you know, sort of the operators who access the CMBS market were usually the ones that um, would would stretch on the financing and, and probably weren't uh, well capitalized enough to, to try to do agency financing um, and lower leverage options. And so, you know, the, the folks who have essentially a, acquired over the last two to three years at, at sort of heightened pricing, um, you know, they sort of, they, they capitalize their assets with prefunded dividends. They you know, they, they bought at four caps, hoping, you know, rent growth would push them to, you know, six and seven caps. Um, that's where you're going to see the problems. Um, you know, and, and I think just from the watch list, we've started, we started to see a, a few of those, you know, come through. Um, but, you know, I, I think as, as everybody's alluding to, you know, there, there, there's, because of a lot of the, the forbearance and, and the forgiveness and the capital infused in the economy in general, um, you're not seeing a wave of distress on the multifamily side. Um, you know, it'll start to, to trickle in over the course of the next six months. I think a year from now, you're going to um, see more opportunity uh, there. And, you know, it, it'll, you know, in the, the better markets, you know, the capital that's waiting to pounce on the sidelines will, you know, won't let that opportunity surface because they'll, they'll be aggressively trying to to buy up properties in, in good locations and quality assets. But, um, you know, in, in more distressed overall markets, and I kind of think of like Houston as one of these, that's, that's almost having a, a double black swan event. I think you're going to see, you know, more opportunity for acquisitions um, just because there's more risk associated with it. But as of now, things have held fairly steady, uh, thankfully, uh, on the multi front. Yeah, and just to echo it, that's, that's exactly kind of what we're seeing um, and hearing from all of our property owners and managers across the U.S., um, obviously people need a you know a place to live, and they've actually been kind of growing their wait list on a number of properties. So, um, as retail has sometimes been a little bit challenging lately, the multifamily space um, does continue to be strong at at the moment. Uh, Chad, how are, how are you underwriting investment targets uh, when there's no COVID vaccine though? Looking forward, uh, you know, into the future. Uh, no, that's uh, that's going to be difficult. Um, you know, like let's take a hotel for example. If we were, you know, to buy a hotel now, uh, empty or shut down or maybe running at 20, 30 percent occupancy, and you know, we don't know when a vaccine will actually be here. We don't know when um, travel patterns will change or increase, and uh, it's it's extremely difficult. I mean, the easiest way to do it would be to try to buy the hotel where you're you know, break even at, uh, you know, 40, 50% occupancy, which isn't, which is, which is gonna be a tough to get a, get a hotel at such a low price. So it's difficult. So I think, I think what you have to do is when, when, when you feel comfortable understanding, you know, what's going on with the virus and what's going on with vaccines, you know, you kind of have to put a couple years, you know, maybe two, three years reserves losses together 
and uh, and make that bet. And and you know if 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 uh, if you're right, you'll do well. But you know if this thing extends, you know beyond and beyond, and no one travels, you know you, you could actually lose money buying uh, hotels, you know even 20, 30 cents on the dollar because carrying costs will will be very expensive, you know, even on an unleveraged basis. So it's so it's very difficult. Now I I'm not I'm more optimistic. I think I think there will be a vaccine. I think the markets will recover. Uh, and be, you know, in five years, be back uh, to where they were uh, last year. So I think, I think what we'll probably do is put in a couple of years reserves on these assets and we go. On retail assets, I think it's a little easier. I think uh, take, take some grocery um, centers with some inline shops that, you know, mostly went out of business. The property goes through foreclosure and, uh, you know, you've got, you've got a grocery store and maybe a 50% leased uh, retail center. We buy the retail center and, you know, you lower the rents and you bring the tenants back and, and I think they'll come back. Uh, so I think retail is a, a lot, a lot easier than hospitality. But one thing I want to mention is on the CMBS, we're tracking it, uh, as, as I mentioned, on a, on a, on a you know, daily basis. And right now there's about $103 billion of, uh, of, of loans and default. And the, and the makeup of the asset class is pretty interesting. I just looked at this. Retail assets make up about 30% of, of, of those assets. Uh, multifamily is actually about 20. So it's, 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 I, I agree with Cross uh, completely because multifamily is the biggest asset, but, but there's, there are quite a few multifamily assets uh, in default. Hospitality, full service, and limited service makes up about a quarter of, of all the defaults. And then office um, looks like it's about 10% mixed use, 10%. And then the balance is, is some other property. So I just thought I'd put that out there to let everybody know where, where the deals are. Thanks. Well, Brian, how you know how are you extracting value when banks and traditional lenders are having an issue with this right now? Uh, so the way we extract value, or or why we are sort of a, a trusted partner of banks or or a good outlet for banks is you know typical traditional lenders are not necessarily set up to handle non-performing loans, you know, they might have a workout department, but that's really not their bread and butter. A traditional lending institution uh, derives its value from lending and creating or, or um, getting interest income. Uh, when properties go into, or I'm sorry, when loans go into distress and they move to either, you know, the special asset desk, they're typically not set up to handle, you know, large influxes. Of, of this type of uh, debt. So if, if they have the ability to get rid of the debt relatively quickly, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about the potential litigation down the road. Uh, you know, if they can work with a, a partner that can execute, get to the closing deal and get it off their books, that's kind of where we come in. And then we have the ability to then therefore, or then contact the borrow, borrower, restructure the loan, um, create some type of workout, uh, and that's kind of really where we we create values is, is as I said, you know, this is something we are set up for and traditional lenders, that's really not their business model. And that's not where they derive their value. That's where we do. Great. I'm going to ask a couple of questions here that we're getting from the audience. Um, so whoever wants to answer, go ahead. Uh, what about loan for investment properties? Um, how easy is it on the foreclosure process? Uh, well, this, this Chad, I, I think, I think, you know, I think the lenders will be back in full force on the foreclosures, um, especially like if you, let's say you're buying a hundred million dollar office building and you're now buying it for, you know, 40 million. And, uh, you know, I think, I think lenders will be there to step up for 50% LTV for 20 million. Uh, you know, it might cost a little more if it's empty. Uh, some points and higher, higher uh, interest rates, but, but the, over my career, the, you know, getting the loan has, has never been kind of the issue. So if you're, if you're buying these things at a significant discount, and, uh, I think, I think the lenders will be there. So, um, and, you know, kind of taking, you know, uh, the other side to the question, cause the question could be interpreted two ways. And one of them might be, how long do you think it is before the lenders will start foreclosing as opposed to whether or not there'll be debt available to finance acquisitions for foreclosed properties. Um, I think that the lenders, uh, you know, are, are looking towards the end of the year in terms of really kicking in the foreclosure process. Um, 
as I'd mentioned earlier, there, there are some impediments in certain jurisdictions to foreclosures, um, you know, certainly on the single family residential, um, you know, and, and in other, in other asset classes, depending on the jurisdiction. Um, I think that that can't go on forever. So I think you'll start to see that kick in, but I, uh, you know, I think that most lenders, and of course, you know, this is not a, not an ironclad rule, but most lenders are doing what they can to wait on the foreclosure, hoping for that, you know, that magic bullet vaccine to, you know, to bring things back to a lesser normal, um, you know, but certainly a better normal than where we are now. I mean, do you think we're going to be seeing growth on the underwriting side in the coming months for both multifamily, retail, and hotels? No. Okay. I think, I think, that I think sums it up. <laughs> I think I think rents are going down in every asset class. Uh, I think I think multi you know residential will hold up much better, of course, because people people need a place to live, and that's the first bill they're going to pay. So I think you know, multifamily and single family do much much better. Uh, but uh, you know th there's going to be um, you know a lot of people are out of work. Uh, the six hundred dollar uh, additional unemployment benefits are about to expire. PPP loans are expiring, and 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 then you know when people are off unemployment, uh, especially in the workforce housing and lower end uh, apartments, it's it's uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be some stress. So rents will come down, I think, and uh, and values will come down. But but I, again, multifamily will hold up much better than than all the other asset classes. And um, and further into that. What we're seeing, at least uh, a lot, you know, probably 80% of what I do is hospitality with the other 20% general real estate and business transactions. So what we're seeing is repurposing of assets. And there is some appetite for that on the lender side, where, for instance, I'm on my third deal now where we have a hotel that is being purchased and will be converted to an apartment building. It, it you know, there's financing for those types of things, you, you know, not at, you know, not a pre COVID, you know, loan to values, but certainly there is financing available for those um, for, you know, for repurposed assets. If you're going from, you know, ho uh, hosp you know, if you're going from hotel to, um, to apartment, you know, multifamily apartment, which is, uh, you know, a, 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 a an asset class that's doing far better than hotels right now. Well, someone's looking to buy non-performing loans. I mean, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, judges throwing out foreclosures for being predatory. Um, what are some of the other risks that people might have? I, I think I can probably jump in and start with this one. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of risks when you're, when you're buying non-performing loans. So I'll just kind of maybe focus on a couple high level ones. Uh, one of the ones that we look at uh, is, you know, the underlying collateral. So, <clears throat> You have to look at not only the property values of the underlying collateral, but there are different risk profiles of each. And just to kind of use sort of the extremes of both ends, what, what we look at is, is the level of underlying business uh, behind that real estate. So industrial properties would have about the lowest amount of business that is underlying, whereas uh, hospitality has the highest. So there's there's a risk profile because if you end up owning that property, you know, what level of experience do you have operating that business? So hospitality uh, would, would be very difficult. And typically that's why we would stay away from that in, in our traditional funds. Another thing that you have to look at from a risk perspective is really uh, your ability to go through the litigation process. Um, it's, it can be very cumbersome. It can be extremely time consuming, uh, can be very expensive. And these are all things that can eat into your returns uh, that, you know, depending on what, what percent of par you purchased the, the debt at, um, you know, the time value of money can, can eat away at a return pretty quickly. And the litigation process can, can easily go from one year to two year to, you know, five to seven years. And then, uh, as I think we were talking about earlier, you know, the carrying cost of those properties can just wipe out any returns that you might have. So, 
So it, it's, re, it's, you know, it's litigation, it's the underlying business. And then obviously there's a whole host of others when it comes to collateral valuation. Uh, you have to look at, uh, you know, interest rate risk, credit risk, all those kind of, you know, the basic risks of debt investing. But from a non-performing loan, those would be two or three of the largest things that we really look at and have to have to understand. Well, I want to ask a question that I get asked probably three times a day. Um, it's kind of for everybody, but where are you guys finding your deals? Um, you know, people are either 1031 in money, they have money sitting on the sidelines. Um, you know, it, literally at least twice a day, I get asked, you know, do you know of anything? Where can I find some deals? What's, what are you guys kind of seeing in the marketplace? Yeah, this is Chad, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, it's still too early guys because there's a lot of everyone's saying the lenders are kind of, you know, extending forbearing and, and hoping for the recovery. So, you know, the, the mass amount of foreclosures uh, that we're predicting are really next year and beyond. So, so they're, they're not there yet. However, with that said, I, I literally this week, I just saw the first bankruptcy deal in Florida come through that hit the market, uh, busted condo hotel with some retail. I, I thought it was interesting. The pricing was really, really high. So I think, um, I don't think that will move, but uh, we're also seeing some REO deals come through, but it's, it's just a trickle. So I, I think it's just too early. Uh, we need to be patient and uh, let, let the properties go through the foreclosure process and remarketing process. And that's gonna take, that's gonna take you know, six, nine months still to see the bulk of those. And, and if you're a lender of a hotel, you, know, you really don't want to take that property back um, for, for the operating reasons mentioned. And also, uh, you, know, you, you know you're gonna take a hit on that on the sale. So you want to extend as long as you can till you, till you can, I think. I think to, to, and pick, going, up, uh, to pick up on what, what Chad was saying, actually what, what Brian mentioned uh, previously, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the, the deal flow and transaction volume will come from, from pre-existing relationships. It's kind of the, you know, the, the lending community that you've had access to and it, it transacted with previously. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that, that's where you'll, you'll kind of see the opportunities, especially kind of from the off market perspective, um, take place. One, one of the more interesting things we've been uh, noodling on, because we were, we were pretty active participants, um, as much as we could be with very little capital uh, in the last downturn. So um, we had a, a smaller portfolio at the time, kind of worked out all of our issues and, um, you know, essentially came out the other side barely uh, surviving the last downturn in kind of 08 to, to 2011. Um, you know, but the, the best transactions that we were able to do at that time were basically within our own portfolio where, you know, we were able to buy out our, our LPs um, at, at significantly discounted pricing. Um, at the same time, we actually uh, ran a special servicing portfolio and, and essentially we're asset managers on about $3 billion of distressed, um, uh, non-performing uh, development loans across the U.S. And, you know, sort of, uh, as Brian mentioned, there's a lot of logistical issues with trying to work out assets in, in different jurisdictions and, um, you know, getting, getting control. And, you know, as with the last downturn, I think everybody's trying to figure out what will you know, what will the new normal look like when we're on the other side of this? Like, how quickly will the economy come back? And, um, you know, I, I think you're, you're often, I, that, that becomes a major factor. I mean, is, is the new normal for retail, you know, going to be an average of 70% occupancy uh, as opposed to 90 plus? Is, you know, is, is it going to take four to five years for the hospitality sector to come back to, to 2019 levels? Or, or will it ever? I mean, what's, What's the, you know, what, what, what is the future look like for convention center hotels? Um, you know, I, and I tend to think there might be in certain sectors a complete repricing, um, you know, uh, of some of these assets. And as you probably, as we've seen over the last like five years, I think cap rates have been compressed across all, all, all sectors. Um, but there's, there was really, you know, almost I, I no justification for a hospitality asset trading at a similar cap rate to a multifamily asset. And, you know, I feel like the risk profile of that wasn't really baked into the pricing that we've seen. And I, I think going forward, there'll be kind of a, a complete recalibration of that once we kind of get to the other side of this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, and one thing that, uh, one thing I would caution against, 
Um, it's great to rework your your existing assets, especially if you can, you know, get some relief from the lender and find, you know, find partners in the deal, um, you know, that are facing cash crises and, you know, might might just want to get out and, you know, and monetize now and risk that the, you know, as opposed to risking that the bottom could be much farther down than than we are at this point. But, you know, as, as somebody who's worked out a lot, um, a lot of loans on behalf of, you know, many, many borrowers, one of the main pieces of advice I give to people that have their own assets is don't be in love with your asset. You know, you know your asset better than anybody else. You need to be, you know, you, know, you need to be, um, uh, you know, um, when you're looking at your asset, make sure that you're being rational and reasonable. If this was somebody else's asset, would you restructure your debt at the amount that the, the lender is asking for you to restructure the debt or bring additional equity to the deal or something along those lines? So, you know, when you have recourse elements to that, it, it's a little different, but, you know, especially on non-recourse debts, don't be in love with your asset. If you, you know, if you're, you know, if you're invested in one deal, but there are other deals that you could put money in that have higher rates of returns because your lender is being, you know, stubborn or unreasonable, you know, make sure your eyes are open there. Well, in this current environment, is anybody looking at deals in, in Europe? And what's everybody's kind of view on how performing and distressed opportunities in the uh, U.S. compared to Europe right now? Uh, this is Chad. I'll jump in. We we are we are looking at uh, public securities in Europe, and um, not not assets. And uh, the, the the public securities are they've actually held up better than we thought. Um, so we're not uh, we we bought we bought some. Uh, in Argentina, actually, and uh, at 90% discounts, we're pretty excited about those uh, those, those, those positions long term. And um, you know, we looked at other markets, but uh, we haven't done any assets. Well, looking forward to 2021. You know, what's what's some advice? You know that everybody would kind of give everybody, you know, that they could start doing now to prepare for 2021. Uh, this, this chat, I'll jump in because I actually want to mention something that on, on the loan defaults, it, it's an absolute tidal wave. And um, uh, it's, what's interesting, it's, 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 I mentioned the asset classes, but it's, it's not really concentrated in one city like you think New York, right? It's everywhere. It's every state, every city, uh, all size ranges, you know, from a million dollars to a billion dollars. And it's, 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 it's quite interesting. So uh, I would not, I'd be very careful if you're trying to buy something right now, because, you know, my view is uh, that value is going down. Everything's coming down because people haven't seen the foreclosures yet and the revaluations. We're just starting to see the uh, reappraisals on these uh, defaulted loans and the, and the values are, you know, they're coming down fast, but I don't think the public's seen them. I don't think, you know, they haven't comped out because they haven't sold. So you, you kind of got to look forward and go, okay, if, you know, these, all these office buildings and hotels and retail centers sell for 30, 40 cents on the dollar. What, what does that look like to the deal I'm doing now? You got, you really need to take that into consideration. So we're not buying anything. We're waiting to see, um, you know, how this fallout hits and how, how low these, these, these uh, prices go. So that, that would be my advice to be very cautious. At least, you know, if it's in, unless it's a, you know, a, a core Amazon 20 year lease and that, that's a different story. So. And I can piggyback on what Chad said uh, from our perspective and looking at the debt. I think it's very similar. You know, we we had raised funds and, and we have cash available on the balance sheet. We have um, a, a lending agreements, uh, you know, lines of credit that are that are available to us. But as Chad said, you know, we're we have the same approach where we're being extraordinarily cautious, um, you know, and, unless the deal is, unless the debt deal is just an absolute slam dunk, you know, we're not really doing anything because we, as Chad said, we need to wait for the process to kind of work itself out. And it's really a matter of time. So going into 2021, you know, getting prepared, it's making sure you have capital. Uh, it, it's understanding that, you know, that that capital might, you know, might be, um, you know that you might have to uh, you know sit on it or 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 just kind of hold it for an extended period of time but i think 
you know, it's, I think the lesson of the day is be prepared to wait and be prepared to be very patient over probably the next 18 to 24 months. So one of the questions that the audience had, and I think you answered a little bit there, but are you, you know, when you raise your funds and continue to raise your funds um, for everybody, are you finding the assets first or are you raising the money um, to then go out and find the assets? Yeah, this is Chad. I'll jump in. Uh, we're definitely raising the money first. We're, we're telling investors, we, you know, blind pools better. Uh, it's too, like we mentioned, it's too early. So uh, investors are, you know, who, who, we're looking to allocate to opportunistic strategies. Understand that, so so we're out. We're you know we're preparing now uh, with with no pipeline, um, other than watching the, the loan defaults. So when do you think we're going to start seeing? Obviously, everything is very up in the air right now. But um, when do you think? that the buying opportunity is going to start due to COVID compared to the pre-COVID pricing? I, I, Depends I think, on that. Yeah, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, yeah, it, 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 I think first quarter, you know, it's kind of, you know, wait till first quarter, you know, just to see what the fallout is and, um, and, and, and beyond basically next year. Yeah. I think that the first quarter is when you're going to start to see the activity but I think that the risk profile for the first quarter is going to be far higher than each succeeding quarter in 2021. I don't believe that we're going to, and maybe I'm just pessimistic about this, but I don't believe that we're going to have any real answers as to the new normal during the first quarter of 2021. We may have some optimism, and the optimism can lead to price spikes, if you will, but it may not it may not be sustainable. Um, you know, being in a, you know, being a hospitality guy, I can tell you that without, you know, without a COVID vaccine, hospitality is doomed in the short term. There, there will be no significant improvement. There'll be mild improvements in certain areas, but big box hotels, you know, and the convention, you know, the convention hotels, those, those may actually have to be repurposed if this continues, you know, you know, for a couple of years. You know, so a vaccine is is really a panacea for the uh, for the hotel industry, and until there is one, there won't be a change there. And and if they and if they do actually come up with one, and and it's proven, I think most lenders, you know, won't foreclose. They'll, they'll wait it out with their sponsors, and uh, you know have the vaccine distributed and people will start traveling again. So we won't see the foreclosures. It's really all based around the virus and the vaccine. Totally agree. A hundred percent. And not only that, what you're seeing, especially for, you know, um, it, it's too early to tell what we're going to see from CMBS. Um, they move, and, you know, even in good times, they move at glacial speeds. So, um, you know, knowing how they're going to project out in six to nine months is, you know, is a very difficult uh, you know, crystal ball to look through, but you know it is. Uh, you know, it's very clear that banks can't absorb the loss by foreclosing on assets or selling the loans at a significant discount at this point. Yeah, you know, they can't. You know, they just can't take all their non non performing inventory and sell it at you know fifty, sixty, seventy cents on the dollar. Um, they won't have the. They they won't have sufficient capital. Um, to meet any regulatory requirements, we'll go back into situations, you know, for those for those who are around in the, you know, in the mid to late '80s and early '90s, we'll go back into those situations, and and you know, and also from you know the 2007 to nine, uh, you know, you know debacle where the banks just don't have, the, you know, the you know the banks will have to be merging and and uh, you know and you know be under uh, regulatory. Um, supervision if they start to recognize all these losses. I think the other thing to, to keep in mind too uh, is just that you know, even when a, a vaccine is available and hopefully it's kind of in the near term and we're talking 12 months, you know, with kind of the, the situation we're looking at, it's, it's very similar to what you know, we went through in, in 08, 09, in 2010. And, you know, to work through those assets and to 
you know, for the economy to actually have the time to recover and, and repair itself, um, it's going to take a, a few years. So, you know, while I, I agree, I think, you know, opportunities are start going to start to present themselves, you know, in, in 2021. I mean, it, it's for, for those folks old enough to, to remember the last time we, we had an event like this, you know, the, the the overall sentiment um, and, and the distress and, and the economic fallout, you know, lasted well into 2010 and 2011 and, and pricing didn't really start to recover, you know, until 2011 and 2012. Um, you know, volumes will be down, um, you know, capital will be on the sidelines looking for opportunity, but, you know, with, with the wave of, of this distress and, and, and foreclosures and workouts, that takes time to work its way through the system and you know it's going to take time for us to go from 15 percent unemployment to levels that we were at pre-virus as well so you know this is going to be you know a situation that we're going through for a number of years um i would draw an analogy you know i would draw an analogy combining the two you know the you know the credit um you know the crunch in 2007 to 2009 and you know the ultimate recovery later on i would blend that with 9 11. this is an extraordinary event you know COVID is completely you know it's a black swan event we've never you know we've never you know we encountered anything like this previously but it's an event that hopefully not definitely but hopefully will have a finite period so 9 11 the hospitality industry fell off a ledge, but that ledge, um, that ledge didn't last too long. This ledge is going to last longer. All, right? all anticipation is if, and again, this is if there is a vaccine that starts to be distributed in the sec by the second quarter of next year, hospitality will not return to 2020, uh, 2019 levels until the end of 2023. Yeah, you know, that's what all the prognosticators that are paid for those uh, you know, prognostications are, uh, are coming forward. So this is not a short-term thing, but the causation of this is something that will, uh, you, you know, will end to a great extent to, you know, when there is a, uh, you know, when there is a vaccine and the remnants of it will be, for instance, an office, you know, will there be a need for less office space, office space as, you know, as people um, are telecommuting more often um, and have gotten used to it over a year period, um, will there be, uh, you know, will there be uh, a complete shift in in retail that is permanent well well, well kind you of know. talking about that that shift and what's happening in in the market um if somebody wanted to employ capital um uh, which asset class between office hospitality retail um do you think we'll see the most rapid bounce back uh, once there is a vaccine well i think hospitality will have the most the biggest bounce back because we could do the vaccine for sure because people you know people want to get out and travel everybody misses you know uh, going to the business meeting and getting on the airplane uh, so there's no without question be hospitality i um, hope so otherwise otherwise i'm going to be very poor for the for the very <laughs> foreseeable future i mean what what are you guys seeing on the on the housing for student housing services um you know areas that have you know kind of been um, brought up by by colleges. I, my 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 son's actually a senior in college, and uh, uh, you know most a lot of these schools are going online, right? And um, and some some haven't done that yet. So either way, uh, I think uh, you know people are putting the kids in less rooms instead of having you know, four kids or college kids in one room, they're having two or one. Uh, so, so that's going to, it's going to be a financial impact on, uh, on these senior housing, I'm sorry, uh, student housing operators. And uh, the revenues are going down, especially uh, until there's a vaccine. So. Have, have you been seeing that's going to affect uh, retail and the other in the in the areas as well with colleges? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, anytime you have uh, uh, lower demographics or less population in any you know, city area, uh, that's going to affect uh, you know revenue for, for for the local retailers for sure. So, I mean, are we are we still looking at just for retail in general um, the values heading downwards? Um, you know, for for the future. I mean, is this something where we think it's going to be a um, you know, six months to a year, or do you see potential headwinds, you know, extending beyond that? That's a great question. I mean, you know, e-commerce continues to take market share, um, and now it's accelerated due to COVID. So um, I think we need to be cautious of that, even post-COVID. That, uh, that the more retail is going online. And clearly, I don't think Amazon can, you know, give you a mani petty, but so those things will be okay. And you know, I think grocery stores, even even though they are doing a lot of online uh, grocery store delivery, I think the local grocery store will still be there because, you know, they can use those grocery stores to have a point of delivery. So I think they'll still do well. Um, but it's it's something to consider. I mean, uh, we were we 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 ran a single family housing re we sold last year and. You know, we were thinking about Amazon and, you know, can Amazon, you know, uh, compete with our business and, you know, you, you can't live on Amazon. So, so I think the residential asset class is pretty immune from that, but, but uh, uh, a lot of businesses aren't. So it's something to be cautious of. Yeah, I'd agree. I think something, um, <clears throat> you know, I think crises don't necessarily create flaws in, in business plans or business models. It merely exposes them or exacerbates them. And I think retail property values and you know the the oversupply of retail had already been exposed, and I think the pandemic and and COVID nineteen has merely exacerbated uh, that that trend. Well, I have a question here on on office space. Um, they were talking about how their company is trying to downsize, and you know what are you seeing in the in the office space? But just kind of want to give my two cents as well from what we're seeing is we're seeing almost two sides of that equation. Um, certain offices, obviously, you know, they are downsizing and looking for smaller spaces, um, but we're also seeing a number of companies who are trying to get um, a much larger footprint um, so that they can um, socially distance better, um, spread people out. Um, so we're kind of seeing on, on both sides where certain companies are, are trying to lower space and other companies are, you know, trying to get significantly more space um, so they can operate and, you know, as safe as way as possible. What what are you guys seeing on on the office side of things? This Chad, I I, I think I've heard both those stories. Uh, we've talked to several real estate brokers, and we're seeing a lot. We're seeing a tremendous amount of subly space hitting the market, which is concerning. Um, so I think I think we'll have to see over time. You know, you know, do we do we have more give back than you know add? But what concerns me about office uh, is. You know, office is extremely capital intensive. The the tenant improvement costs, you know, have increased um, a lot over the you know the last ten years, and uh, it's very expensive to turn these tenants. So when you have office buildings with rents going down and and you have prolonged ownership and you have to turn the tenants a couple times, it's gonna be very difficult to make money in office unless your basis is really low. So you just need to take that into consideration. This is this is cross, and um, while while we're primarily in the multifamily space. I mentioned previously that we, we are working on um, several large scale mixed use projects, which we're, we're going to be developing over the next decade or so. And those will have a significant office component to them. Um, right now, we're kind of in the planning design uh, and permitting phase of these. And we're working with some large national uh, co-developers in the office space. But we are, are very much trying to figure out what that world looks like going forward, how, how office buildings themselves evolve uh, in the future, but also like what the, what the tenant needs are going to be. And, you know, thus far, while there's, you know, a significant amount of, of that sublease space available, as, as Chad mentioned, um, you know, it, it's almost a tale of two cities, right? Because you're going to have a, a struggling economy where people, where, where you know, business owners are, are looking to uh, reduce their, their office expense essentially but then you've got you know some of the the largest um 
you know, companies in, in the world that are, are doing well in this, uh, in this environment. They're, they're growing market share, their profits are up. Um, you know, I, I live in Austin and, and we are blessed to have, you know, Oracle, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook all have a huge presence here and soon to be Tesla. Um, these companies are faring very well. And, and I think they'll be, you know, some of the ones that, you know, are easily able to, you know, digest, you know, more open space and more office allocated per employee, um, you know, than pre-COVID. Um, whereas a lot of the smaller businesses, I think, are, are going to look to condense um, and, and have their employees work from home and to kind of lower their costs. So it, it certainly is, uh, I think, could be a tale of two cities going forward. Well, kind of a question, we just have a couple of minutes left here, but kind of going along with that and a question that I've been asked and uh, you know, not to get political, but if there is a change in, in leadership and, you know, taxes do go up, do you see uh, a potential influx of business and both capital moving uh, to states with, with lower tax rates? Possibly, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, especially, especially, I think people live in California and New York. I mean, I've, I've thought, I've actually thought, I live in California, I've thought about moving to Florida um for a while and you know they're talking about changing the prop 13 tax on commercial real estate out here and and that's going to have an immediate devaluation of all commercial real estate overnight if that passes in november so it's very concerning and then they're you know they're, they increase your 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 you know your income tax and your property tax wow you know, it's not, not a lot of motivation to stay i think that a lot of that uh, i think you're right on target with state taxation and and local real estate tax uh, you know taxation i think with regards to federal taxation which would be you know most likely the initial you know the initial bump here that people haven't moved to less uh to more favorable tax states and you know in you know in large numbers if you will um, in the past when tax increases came in. I wouldn't anticipate that there would be that much of that as a result of, say, Biden, you know, um, becoming president and, you know, there being some sort of, uh, there being a tax backlash or increase. I think that the, you know, the bigger issue would be, you know, for, you know, for state, um, you know, taxes where people will leave a place like California um, or New York City you know, to go to places like, uh, you know, like Florida, um, where, you know, where there's much lower taxation. Um, I think that you also, um, you also need to look at from a, um, you know, from a standpoint of the residential mortgage tax, I think that will impact where people want to live. If that comes back, you know, in a bigger way, um, or becomes, impacted from a negative or positive standpoint in any tax legislation, you know, that could have a significant impact on where people want to live. I think another concern guys is, is if, uh, you know, Biden's elected, uh, taxes go up, I think, you know, investment dollars will be a little more cautious. Uh, R and D dollars will be more cautious. It'll be a slower growth, uh, you know, economy. Uh, I think, I think with Trump in office, uh, he's definitely more pro business. And um, people, you know, invest more money to take more risk to create more jobs quicker. So I just think uh, if Biden gets elected, it's going to be a much slower recovery, especially if he raises taxes. Well, just kind of closing everything up. Um, obviously, this is capturing opportunities. Does anyone have a kind of a last, you know, remark here on what they would do or what they would suggest people do to capture opportunities in the future? Uh, guys, just to interrupt here, we're at 11.30, yep, and um, this was scheduled to end five minutes ago, so I want to respectful nope. for, the next, um, for the next presenter. So if you want to keep this to, like, literally five, ten-second answers, um, that's great. If not, we can skip it. I think we just move forward. Okay. Um, thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian, Cross, Chad, Stephen. This was an excellent, excellent panel. Um, I sat back taking notes um, of 
the discussion today. Uh, you guys really demonstrated your expertise in the different spaces. We weren't able to cover all of the um, all of the the questions uh, that came in, but I'll I'll share them with the panel after we're able to. Uh, process all of the information and hopefully you can reach out to these people uh, that are asking the questions and follow up with them directly. Uh, Dave Lamb, you did an excellent job uh, moderating this panel. I want to thank you again. I want to thank Sunstar for being a member of FLYA. And if you have any um, insurance needs, uh, please reach out to, to Dave. Thank you guys.